And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PreneurCast. Yeah, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Tom Gosher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if you want to. Visit us online at preneurmarketing.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of PreneurCast with me, Dom Goucher, and him, Pete Williams. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. Hello. Yes, definitely welcome, everyone. Um, interesting show for you folks this week. We are going to do that catch-up that we promised where we finish off answering the Q&A questions that we started answering on our live 100th show. Uh, we've had a lot of other things that have come up that we thought was were important. We wanted to get those out, but people have asked us about the questions. They're looking forward to the answers, so this show is all about that. Before we dive in, Pete, uh, just a little bit of a, our usual little review of the week. Um, I would imagine that any member of the Preneur community would have to have been basically away on holiday or not paying attention to not have noticed a little um, challenge that you set me for the <laughs> for the Magcast launch. Yes, thanks for that. <laughs> You're doing all right. You're still alive. You're pushing through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We 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 made it. You know, little little bit cat out of the bag kind of thing. Um, we're going to do a wrap up about the whole thing. But uh, anybody who's followed along will know. Um, you know that we we against the odds. Um, we we made it. We we published a digital magazine inside of a week. Um, for values of, uh, but it was it was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> with a lot of surprises and a lot of uh, a lot of um yeah, just uh, just pulling a lot of things out of the bag definitely yep. but it, it was definitely a great experience love doing it great feedback from everybody on it uh, really enjoyed it and um but yeah i'm looking forward to getting some sleep Ah, very cool, mate. Very cool. Well, uh, yeah, so basically, for those who don't know, let's just give them a quick recap. Basically, um, you know, we've been supporting Ed Dale um, for a number of years with the various projects, and his latest one uh, he's making public uh, for the second time with the second intake is his Magcast Digital Publishing Blueprint, which is all about publishing digital magazines, becoming a legitimate publisher of magazines uh, through Apple's newsstand and soon to be released Android and Kindle. So we basically uh, decided, or, or you know, I guess we, we'll say we decided that you should do a challenge. We'll, we'll be diplomatic about it <laughs> uh, and actually show people how easy it actually is to become a, a legitimate publisher in this space uh, within a week. And you set out to create uh, Making Online Videos magazine, which is obviously a, a big niche and passion of yours. Um, so it's basically this is a video diary of you sort of starting from nothing and producing this uh, magazine, or at least the first edition of the magazine within seven days and it's, uh, it's been a quite a fun little journey a few highs few lows and, and have a few pivots uh, as we've spoken about on the show before but um yeah if you check out on the blog at printermarketing.com you better see some of those videos uh, up there right now yeah and uh there's there there is as always you should know with these things um I've, i finished the magazine but there's a delay with it being approved by the apple newsstand store hopefully by the time you're listening to this if you're one of those people that doesn't listen immediately when we publish um i'll have got my approval and you'll be able to see the real deal out there but if you uh, want to know when it goes live you want to be kept up to date if you actually go to the the website makingonlinevideo.com there'll be a box there you can put your email address in and i'll be sure to let you know um, and uh, anybody who puts their name in that box, there may be a little bit of a bonus for you uh, when we go live. I'll let you know. So uh, pop over to makingonlinevideo.com uh, and check out where I've got to. Awesome. So Pete, while I was uh, while I was doing all that hard work, uh, what were you up to? Um, oh, I'll just kick it back and uh, listening to Arnold Schwarzenegger's new book. Just you know, living the good life. No, lots, lots, Arnold lots Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger, that well-known literary genius. Well, this is a funny thing is that like for those who sort of obviously know the persona of Schwarzenegger being, you know, the bodybuilder, the actor and obviously the politician, you kind of can, can laugh at him a little bit. But it's an amazing story. Uh, Total Recall uh, is the book title, which is obviously a bit of a play on, on some of his movie titles. But it's just very interesting about, you know, how hard he actually worked to get his success in obviously the three different areas. And he kind of talks about it throughout the book. It's 23 hours long, the audio version. What? 
Yeah, it's insane. Um, so even at two speed, it's still you know eleven and a half hour audiobook. It's just incredible, um, and it just it's amazing how hard he worked. You know, people sort of say, oh yeah, he was lucky just to sort of fall into these roles in the eighties when the big sort of larger than life movie star um, genre kind of came to be. But you know, something I didn't know is he actually won a Golden Globe back in nineteen seventy six for best debut actor. I think it was in a motion picture, like blew my mind that was you know very first role he won a golden globe for and then it wasn't until six years later of continual late night after hours acting classes that he actually got the conan role which is obviously where he became sort of you know mainstream famous um beyond the bodybuilding world and it's just a really interesting story to see like a guy who's had you know a huge amount of success you know some lows in recent times um but you know he is a worker and you know it's about doing the reps which is obviously a tie back into his bodybuilding days but you know i think it is a really interesting story whether you're interesting interested in bodybuilding interested in politics interested in movies just interested in, in sort of what it takes to be you know this overnight success and that you know he didn't just kind of become a politician off the back of his movie brand, he actually worked hard at it. And so, yeah, uh, it's, it's so far, it's been a really interesting listen. I haven't got through it all yet. I haven't been that lazy this week to sit down and listen to, you know, 11 and a half or 12 hours of audio at two speed. But uh, yeah, Total Recall, it's a really interesting listener. Listen. Cool. I, it, I, I, made, I make a joke, but I actually am aware to a point of, of some of his history. You know, there have been various documentaries and things mm. in, in years gone by. And, and I've always been aware of that, that, thing that he really did work hard mm. you know especially in those early years the ones that people don't know about he just seemed to pop up out of nowhere mm. if you don't know the story so it's it's um i'm i'm actually yeah it's another yet another one that will go on my list yep. that's at least a, a week and a bit's worth of dog walking that <laughs> <is>. <laughs> actually, actually, as a side, i actually feel like giving him a bit of an honorary mention uh or membership to the preneur community because he actually uh one of the first businesses he hustled and started when he moved to the states was a mail order business Oh, yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, a lot of interesting facts about this uh, this larger than life, as I said, character. Excellent. And uh, is that from our sponsor from Audible? Absolutely. So that? yeah, another one from uh, Audible dot com. Uh, so if you head over to Audible dot sorry no Audible Trial sorry uh, Audible Trial dot com forward slash Preneurcast. Uh, if you're a first time Audible user, you can sign up there and they will give you a free gift of a download. So any audio book you could download. And obviously, this week's recommendation is Total Recall by Arnold Schwarzenegger. So head over to uh, the Audible site, the trial site, and uh, yeah, get yourself a free book. Awesome. Awesome. Great recommendation. Cool. Well, uh, as people have been waiting a while for these uh, Q&A questions, shall we dive right in and get on with it? Let's do it. Okay. So we've had a... We've, these, we, we've actually asked people to, where possible, to actually uh, record their questions uh, using our little speak pipe tool on the website. And so we've got a couple of people actually have recorded their questions. Not everybody was available to do that. So we, we've taken them you know, from the original log, chat log and things. But... Uh, John in the UK is our first person that uh, came through with a question, and uh, let's have a quick listen. Hi, Pete. Hi, Dom. Um, firstly, big thank you for, for actually doing the, um, the productivity um, podcast with regards to the productivity apps that you use it on a daily basis. I'm actually using those now in my business and my staff are actually using those um most notably evernote which uh couldn't actually live without now one sticking point that i've got though pete dom um when i listen to the podcast which i think if i re remember correctly brand should be a byproduct from there um i mean don't quote me but i started to focus more on actually building my online presence with regards to LinkedIn. Um, again, there's another great podcast on that uh, with Wayne. Um, also, I, I, I sort of seem to push, you know, the, the, the online profile of myself rather than the business, uh, which is sort of a web design and online marketing business. And from then listening to um, Micro Domination with Trevor Young, I'm, I'm sort of... I know it's a long-winded question, but I'm in between the two with regards to where do I focus my time? Is it do I concentrate more on myself as trying to be a leader in the industry or in the field, um, or do I do I sort of do that, you know, in in the spare time and fo focus on on actually building 
the business, um, build the community, build the brand, grow your business, live the dream as uh, another one of your um one of your friends says um so yeah i just wanted to get your thoughts on that because it's something that just irritates me as i'm as i'm trying to sleep at night it's just um i'm trying to get everything organized i'm trying to take on board everything that he's saying and yeah is is it push myself is it push the business is it a bit of both i just really want to gather your your thoughts both pete and and dom on that one if you could please so really what john's asking about there is about his focus about his promotion he's got these two entities or whatever you know and i think it's a very common thing that he doesn't really know and he's asking what you do because i think this is something that, that, that pete you very much are aware of um should he focus on promoting himself as a persona and a brand or, or on the business promotion or is there a way to separate the two yeah, look, I was actually talking about this recently with a consulting client and um, look, you know, the, the, the example I gave to a certain extent is uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. Now, everyone probably knows Gary V, um, very, very large in life character as well, keeping with that sort of theme of the show um, with his, you know, social media commentary and he's a very big brand in his own right now but you have to look back at how that actually came about. You know, when he first started his business career, obviously he took over his parents' wine um, retailer and took it online and started Wine Library TV, which was the brand uh, he used to create, you know, daily or, you know, weekly videos uh, of him talking about different wine. And it was very much the brand was Wine Library TV. So as a byproduct of building his business, he built the Wine Library TV brand and as a byproduct of the Wine Library TV brand, he created the Gary Vaynerchuk brand. And this is the important thing in my opinion because you know it comes down to what type of business are you trying to build? And this is a bit of a strategy question to start with and it really gives you direction when it comes to tactics. So you know, thinking about, okay, are you trying to build a business that can, can work and leverage and grow without you, uh, that you can one day sell, that can give you some passive income, or are you happy to you know, put that passive income uh, lifestyle type business aside and grow an ego-based business because they're very two different things uh, because if you're building a brand which is you and you are focusing on you're the social media, you're the face of the business, your, your name is the business, everyone is going to want to work with you. Every single client, every person who comes through those doors is going to want a piece of you uh, because you, you're the person who's the face. Uh, so, you know, that can be a good thing, can be a great thing, but the problem with it is, is selling the business becomes very hard, getting out of the business on a day-to-day -day thing becomes very, very hard. Whereas if you look at other brands uh, out there where it's the business as a brand, you don't know the person behind it, you don't really care. You know, so on social media, the brand has a social media page. You know, places like, you know, Evernote have their um, social media being around the brand of Evernote. And then what you'll see quite often in some of these sites, and I don't know if Evernote does this, so I might be sort of mishing, mashing two things, but you'll see the brand has the uh, Twitter page, for example. And on the actual Twitter page, the background graphic will have two or three photos of staff members who look after their social media campaign, and you'll have like Evan, and then it'll have um, a little star EV next to his name. So when they tweet out, they put a tweet and finish it with three characters being star EV. So you actually get an idea of, you know, there is a person behind that tweet. It's not a tweet from the brand directly, but it's the brand's uh, social media presence, if that makes sense. And that is, the, you know, what I really suggest. You know, obviously, it's from a preneur perspective, this is one of those times where you do what I say, not what I look like I'm doing. You know, what I mean by that is, you know, the preneur brand is very much me and obviously Dom as well playing along. Um, so we are that. And, you know, preneur is never going to be as a brand specifically with things like the podcast and the blog and stuff like It's never going to be bigger than me. It doesn't, doesn't need to be bigger than me. I don't want it to be bigger than me. But things like Infinity Telecommunications, Simply Headsets, Stitch Software, all those other business units and business projects that we have here, those things are never going to be Pete Williams. You know, I'm going to sort of, you know, 
talk about it. I'm going to be the person who writes the blog posts and appears in the adverts and on the online video. Like, you know, if you go to simplyheadsets.com.au, for example, or our YouTube channel, which is Simply Headsets, you know, you'll see the videos. Like, I'm in all those videos uh, for the products, but they're not branded as Pete Williams. It's simply, hi, I'm Pete Williams from Simply Headsets. Uh, so it's I'm an employee. I am a part of a bigger entity because, you know, simply is, is bigger than me. It needs to be bigger than me. It needs to run without me, those sort of things. There's a big differentiation based on the strategy you're trying to build your business on and then the implementation tactics come based off that. I, I mean, it, it, it's at the beginning of your answer, you gave the option. Yeah. You, you said you can, you can do this. You could you could go the the business as an entity route or the you know the ego based business route right yep um, but really as you as you close there our, from our point of view and and this is something that I'm kind of working hard towards it's something I think you've achieved with 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 exactly the example you gave it's like anything that I start now is its own thing yeah it, it, it if i if I refer to it. I refer to it as a project that I work on, like the way that you you know you refer to simply headsets um, as one of your businesses. But you don't spend all day talking about simply headsets. You talk about your world of all the different things that you do, mm-hmm. and that's one of those things. Um, so, so to me, it, it, they they are they are entities. You are an entity. Um, you know, even if you don't want to be a brand, you should still be an entity. I would say, well, um, I and and if you look out there, just just to give you another example based on yours before we come back, um, there's a, a company out there that makes uh, that does customized digital printing. Excellent, excellent product. Um, company called Moo. Oh, going to get it, but You love Moo, don't you? You love it. I love Moo. Duh, they're so slick. They're great. Um, can, can I interrupt? Can I ask you a question? What do you love more, Moo cards or? the book that you love the most, The Lean Startup. If you have to choose one to go to bed with every night, do you choose to go to bed with Moo, Car- Moo Cards or The Lean Startup? Moo Cards. Ooh, okay. All right, back to your regular scheduled programming. Sorry to interrupt. Because <laughs> um, you can, I mean, honestly, it, I actually can't choose because I can make an argument for both of them. Um, but I just wanted to shock you. Um, Moo cards. Their their Twitter account is overheard at Moo, um, which you know it's just a random thing. But they don't they don't do the thing that you say about the 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 individual people trying to put personality on that account. It's just news about the company. They use it as a as, they use it for what Twitter's about. It's a broadcast medium for for the news. And so many software companies and and service companies and people like that have this company Twitter account. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, this is actually this all this reflects is in, in also in a piece of advice from um, Jen Sheehan, who is very well known in the world of Facebook and Facebook advertising, and uh, a good friend of both of ours, and um, and some other very well known and important political figures around the world. <laughs> and um, she has always said, and always always said, you know, if, when you set up a Facebook page, not an account, but a page, um, you should set up one for your business one for you and then one for potentially any product lines or or groups of products and things like that and you can see this if you look at what bigger companies do but there's nothing wrong with you doing it as a smaller thing um, and it's all steps towards this stuff that we talk about all the time which is not working in your business but working on your business by see, treating them as entities in your mind and letting other people see them as entities i think Actually, you know, John expressed confusion and difficulty with what to do, but I think once you get that entity thing, it becomes clear in the way that it is for you, Pete. Mm. Well, well, something else, just a, a very small side point that it's worth considering for a few people is I was having lunch, I was actually probably about 12 months ago now actually, uh, with a, a long-term friend of mine who's a the marketing manager for a, uh, a national um retailing chain here in Australia. It's uh, not franchise, it's all company-owned stores. I've got, you know, got 100 around Australia or something. So quite a, you know, important role. And it was talking about trying to find someone to help with um, some social media uh, management for the, for the brand and wanted to outsource it. And I, I gave him a suggestion and he's like, 
of a, of a person whose sort of brand was themselves. So they're obviously one of the best, but a small um, team, small brand based on him. And his response was, I would love to, but I can't. And I was like, well, you know, what does that mean? Why can't you guys? Because the board and the, you know, the, the, the group, like, although I'm the, the head person, I can't, you know, sign off on everything myself. It's got to be, you know, signed off by a team and we do external, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, we can only go with agencies. You know, we, 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 we and, and agencies are, you know, t- t- generally probably going to be worse than this person. However, uh, it's a perception thing that, you know, the board won't won't think that a one-name brand person is going to be able to give us what we need. They, they want an agency. They always have. They always do no matter what. Uh, and that was a very interesting comment to hear that, you know, perception is reality. Um, that's just a given statement in a lot of things. But, you know, so you want to make sure if you're trying to go and get the big fish that you are going to be bigger than who you are. Uh, and that's very, very important as part of the strategy you need to think about. It's funny, actually. That's that's exactly what I was going to, an example I was going to bring up after you. <laughs> I wasn't sure where you were going with that, but that, that was exactly what I wanted to bring up is this idea that if you if you have your business entity and you as an entity, you're suddenly bigger than just a one-man band, a self-employed person, a solopreneur, whatever. You're a person who runs a business and does other stuff. Yep. Yeah? It's, it's a tiny thing, but it can make a huge difference, especially in a context like you just gave there. Great example. So, cool. I mean, we're, this, is, this is going quite deep into social media. And uh, oddly enough, we're, Maria also asked a question about social media, but she suggested that we, we, we actually focus an episode on it. Now, interestingly, we've never done that, have we? I don't think we have actually done a full social media, like how, how, how's, how to incorporate social media into your business, which would be an interesting conversation yeah. to have, I think. Yeah, and, and, and uh, you know, Maria asked, you know, basically she wants to know what we do. And, and, you know, the people that we know and, and what we think is a good strategy. So I think that'll make a great episode. So, Maria, we're out. there you go. Maria, we're taking your suggestion. And look out for an episode on that coming soon. Sounds great. So, yeah, we've, got a, we've now got a second speak pipe message. This is from Kelly in the UK. Um, so let's have a quick listen to Kelly's question. Hi, this is Kelly from Whitecraft's Wedding Stationery based in the UK. Um, My question is related to productivity. I know, Pete, you've just had a new baby, and I'm sure that you're feeling this too. As um, being self-employed, my husband's self-employed as well, and having two very young children, uh, how do you find the time to do everything and spend time with your family without feeling guilty about not spending time on your business and feeling guilty about not spending time with your family? and um, getting to bed before two o'clock in the morning. Um, Any tips would be very welcome. Um, I hope that your newborn is healthy and well and um, that you're managing to juggle it a little better than than we are. But um, I look forward to hearing your response. Thanks. So, Pete, I'm thinking this question is going to resonate with you because it's about somebody with a, a new family, uh, with new demands on their time, and they basically, you know, she said she wants to know how you do it, yeah, and <laughs> how you get everything done. Yeah, well, look, I, I think the, um, the the easy answer is a uh, an amazing wife who's not entrepreneurial, um, and it, it's probably going to be not the answer most people really want. Um, I remember making a joke in our wedding speech, and, and I think Lucky Fleur doesn't listen to the show, um, but she did agree with it and everyone did get a good laugh out of it during the wedding. It was that, you know, I, I looked forward to, to um, my wife uh, starting a family and living out a career goal of a lady who lunches. Um, in that, like, so, so, so you know, I, am, I am very, very lucky in that, you know, Fleur and I have been together for eight or nine years now and she knew what she was getting into uh, when we started dating in that my work, uh, you know, is, is a big part of who I am and what I do. So, you know, I think, you know, the, the real, you know, personal answer is that I've got a very, very understanding an amazing wife who, um, you know, just loves being a mum and, and that's what she wants to do. So she, you know, is that sort of more traditional sort of relationship where she cooks and does the cleaning and stuff like that. And some people who listen to this might think that's very, very sexist and, and, and hate that, but it, it works exceptionally well for us and we're both very, very happy with it. So that's sort of, I guess, the technical answer for me personally. Um, the advice answer, uh, sorry, the advice answer would be a little bit different. Um, I think it is a, about streamlining and I've, I've definitely done that over the last seven months um 
with Eli in that I, I've realized there was certain stuff that I was doing that I'm just not doing anymore. Like, you know, I hardly watch YouTube videos anymore. So, you know, it's the, it comes back to that core versus mechanics type assessment of, you know, what is it that you're actually doing every day that has a direct correlation to profit uh, and making sure that all the, uh, the paraphernalia and, you know, superfluous, hopefully I pronounced that right, uh, bits and pieces that, you know, the busy work that you used to do starts dropping away. You know, you don't spend time um, chasing the, the new idea, the new course, the new whatever it might be that's going to keep you busy when you haven't implemented what you already know. I think it comes down to being very, very clear on what it is you want, implementing what you already know. And I would say most people, I would say a good chunk of people listening to the show, who listen to the show regularly, would have a decent enough knowledge to actually take action without having to go and obviously, you know, learn some amazing new ideas and jump from, from idea to idea. So I think it is really just about being structured, um, getting rid of the, the crap that you're doing, uh, getting more streamlined, uh, doing core versus mechanics assessments. Uh, and I spoke about this on an interview recently this week that I, that I gave. Someone was asking me about sort of what is what the biggest productivity tip I could give. And, you know, I think it applies here. And that is, you know, one day, um, you know, every day for the next 30 days or at least for the next seven days is start the day with a blank sheet of paper and every time you do an action for your business, write down what it is. And then at the end of the day, do an assessment and get a red pen out and next to every single item on that list, give it an M or a C, M for mechanics, C for core or W for waste and you just start going through it all. And at the end of the day, assess, okay, out of my entire day, I did 20% of things that were wasteful. All right, cool, that's fine. Accept that. That's who I want. Tomorrow, I try and do 19%. Just make small, gradual um, process and progress. Uh, the next thing is obviously looking at the, at the mechanical stuff. What is the stuff that you didn't actually have to do? And look at outsourcing. Uh, and you know, we'll be talking about outsourcing a lot um, throughout the month of September. So keep an eye out on emails and the blog and stuff like that. We've got a lot of outsourcing stuff planned for the month of October. Uh, so that'll definitely help you get a lot of the stuff because you'll be very, very surprised. And you know, we've done this um, with a, a private group when we were in Florida last year, Dom, uh, and lots of consulting clients. Is it's amazing how much. Uh, core, sorry, sorry, it's amazing how much mechanical stuff you're actually doing when you sit down, take a moment and assess it. And the best way to do that is just work through your normal day. Don't assess as you go. Assess at the end of the day and look at that to-do list or have done list more than a to-do list. So have done list because to-do lists are always beautiful. You sit down at the start of the day and you, you give your list what you're going to do during that day. And it's all positive. It's all, you know, it's all core, very little mechanics. But you get to the end of the day and there's a lot of other shit that actually hit your desk. Uh, so it's better off doing a, you know, a have done list and then assess that and obviously just stick with the core stuff. So that core versus mechanics versus waste assessment, the have done list is a very, very important thing. Uh, and the final thing I'd suggest is positive constraints, it's something that I still do and I think no doubt it has helped the family and helped me get through stuff is that the night before, I'll plan the next day. I'll do my to-do list for the next day. If i got to go swimming, I will get my swimming gear out. Uh, I will do that sort of stuff the day and the night before so that way I have a positive constraint uh, and minimal excuses the following morning, the following day when I need to get started. They're kind of the, the four or five big chunks that I would suggest, um, you know, you play with Kelly and, and see how they go and then let us know, report back, how does that have done assessment work? How does the positive constraints work? How does eliminating that waste work for you? You mentioned the workshop we did last yep. year. Um, and, and yes, I mean, that was the core versus mechanics assessment, I think was one of the things we got the biggest result from, the biggest response from the audience, the realisation about how much... It wasn't so much the wasted time. I don't think many people waste a lot of their day or don't feel that they wasted a lot of their day. But, but when they realise that the things that they're doing are mechanics yep. um, or that they are not core to their business they're not moving the business forward they're not growing the profit they're not you know core business activities um you know that was a huge eye-opener for a lot of people in that workshop um now i have my own version of this that i'm going through right now as, as a side note though before you do that i'm just gonna make i'm making a note right now i'm gonna actually try and drag out the old corvus mechanics um tracker that we produced for oh, that yeah. private group. I'm going to try and find it. I have no idea where it is. It'll be around somewhere. Maybe it's on your um, external wouldn't hard drive. It be, wouldn't it be awesome if you had a guy 
that kept track of that stuff for you. And name files properly in good folder structure. That would be yep, super yep. awesome. Because then you wouldn't have to do it. Let's try and track it down, Dom, and uh, we'll throw it up on the blog at preneurmarketing.com. We will try and track that down, Pete. Give it a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I, to, to, you know, Kelly, Kelly said both herself and her husband are self-employed, which makes the situation quite difficult and, and a little bit different to yours. Yes. Um, and I, I'm going through a situation that's, that's, that's similar in context but very, very different. My girlfriend uh, recently broke her ankle very, very badly while out walking the dog. Um, and prior to that event, she represented your Fleur. She was incredibly understanding. She managed the house and a lot of the peripheral tasks, uh, cooked wonderful meals, looked after the, the dog and the cats and everything else. Um, and I got to get on with what I was doing, which represents in parallel with you, you know, those, those household things. Um, she was very happy to do that. Great setup for me. Everything was awesome. She broke her ankle, was completely housebound, bedridden, the whole, got to have an elevate, a leg elevated all the time. And it was like literally overnight, I went from, I don't actually know what the process is to do that, like walk the dog. Um, and I certainly can't cook. I mean, I can burn water. Um, to, I am now responsible for every last thing in the house, literally. Every, jo every job in the house, everything I was doing before, full-time job, everything else, plus the full-time household stuff as well. So in, in like over the last couple of weeks, I've gone through this transition and it's like, and it's, it's like you know, when you, I think when, when Eli was born, um, you know, you, you went through that shock moment that a lot of new parents go through, which is oh, you know, yeah. the demands on your time. Um, and I have to say, you know, we always say we talk about what we do. That's what we do on this podcast. We don't, we, we don't just talk about things for the sake of it. We talk about what we do. And I can tell you that what has saved me and meant that I've stayed able to actually keep myself afloat and keep going these last few weeks has been assessing core versus mechanics. Do I need to, is what I'm doing valuable to my business? Is it core? Yes or no? No, drop it. Don't even bother asking somebody else to do it. Just don't do it gone number one number two is it mechanics yes find somebody else to do it you know as i always say just because you can doesn't mean you should and in this case trust me every time i look at something now and i go do i need to do that no right find somebody else so that the outsourcing for me has been the the savior the ability to 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 just give other people these jobs know that they're going to get done and then get on with something else. You know, when, when my girlfriend is actually back on her feet again, my, my life, my work life, will have probably just improved by, by an order of magnitude by this, by this not self-imposed positive constraint. Mm. Yeah, I've got, I'm going through this and it's incredibly painful. You know, don't, don't get me wrong, folks. This is, this is hard work. You know, the last couple of weeks have been very, very hard on me. Um, but... The positive side of this is that when everything goes back to normal and, and there is somebody else there to help me, that I'll have been forced to put these processes in place uh, and the benefits will be phenomenal. I'm going to um, try and send an email to Kiwi though and see if she can snap a photo of you in an apron at the sink. That would be awesome. You know if she does? You know what, you know what the extra, extra thing will be? It'll be me wearing my headphones, listening to my audio books while I'm doing the dishes. See, that... That's a photo worth having on the site. I think we would lose readers hand over fist. <laughs> 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 and on that note, I think we'll maybe move on to the next question. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, now, M Michelle uh, was on the call. Uh, and Michelle uh, had, had quite a few questions for us. <laughs> We're going to try and get through Michelle's questions um, because they're great questions. I think that people will find the answers valuable to. Uh, Michelle in Tasmania um, and her husband, Simon. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Um, so lots of a wide range of questions. And the first one is, uh, I suppose this is personal because I've got my answer and you might have yours. When is the most productive time to write copy? 
when you're sitting at there. Copywriting again. I'll give over. Um, well, this, yeah, this is a funny thing. Like personally, for me, I'm a morning person. I like to write uh, in the morning. I know, uh, you know, ex guest of ours, Tim Ferriss, he writes at night. Um, I think it's a personal thing, unfortunately. I, I'd love to be able to say that if you sat down at your desk facing north uh, in a room at 24 degrees Celsius uh, at 9:38 on a Tuesday morning, uh, is the best time to write copy but realistically i think it is just you know when you actually write and you know all the writers you know who, who write about writing uh, funnily enough um say it's, it's about habit and just you know you, you you write the same time every day and you build that muscle and over time it comes so you know personally for me i'm a morning person i like to sit down um you know in the morning um Quite often, I'll go for a run. Uh, I don't know Michelle and Simon are runners. Uh, we've been for a couple of runs together when they've been in Melbourne. Uh, so I would like to go out, get the blood flow, uh, and then come back. And I'll often write in my running gear. I'll just come back, um, you know, my head's clear. I'll think about it a little bit while I'm running, and then just come back and sit and start churning stuff out um, whilst whilst running. Um, so that's sort of, I guess, my personal routine when I write copy. Uh, but, you know, it's a hard question to answer, unfortunately, in terms of is there a perfect time? But it, it, I think you're right. I mean, the, there is the one other thing. I mean, you, you mentioned habit there and one of the people that, you know, uh, we've, I think we've both read uh, Stephen King's book about yep. his on, writing. On writing. And his writing habit. Um, and he says, you know, he, he goes to the same place uh, at the same time every day and he just sits there until something comes out and you know if you have the luxury that you can do that you know then that's the ultimate habit um but it is you have to i think you just have to find your thing it's like i am a morning person uh which is really lucky because so is the dog uh, <laughs> you know um you know i mean i'm getting up i mean you you're a crazy crazy morning person you're up at like 5 30 a.m or something well i've i've moved Sleeping, my dude. clock Sorry? That's a sleep in. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've moved my clock, and this is something else that actually a, 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 f a, friend, a friend of mine uh, mentioned to me. Great piece of advice. And maybe this refers back to what Kelly was asking. Maybe it's relevant, maybe it's not. But I used to get up when I, when I got up, maybe 7, maybe 8 a.m., and, and I'd, I'd get, get into my day and whatever. I've, through this positive constraint and also through a choice, I've moved my clock back and I now get up at six and I now have an extra hour in the morning before my world explodes and before people come online and start wanting to, you know, my outsourcers clock in and start, you know, sending reports or doing whatever they're doing. You know, I have this hour where there's nobody. Nobody bothers me. There's no phone calls. I switch everything off. I don't check my email. Um, and I use that hour in the morning because I'm a morning person and like you, you know, I go out, I take the dog for a walk, I come back, I go for my swim in the sea and then I come back and that's when I do my writing. But I'm a morning person. Maybe you can make a slot in the evening, you know, yep. um, whenever works for you. But I, I actually have a couple of things to, talk, to say about copywriting or writing copy um, on that. And the first one, uh, we mentioned Ed Dale at the beginning of the call and I just want to bring up something that Ed has said a number of times, you know, we've spoken to him and also he's, he's written about this as well because Ed is a prolific content creator. Um, and he always says, and I completely agree, one of the challenges with writing is when you're trying to write something is trying to get it perfect while you're writing it. He said, and that's a, that's a fatal, fatal, fatal mistake. What you should do is get it out of your head in whatever way possible, he had lots of tricks for doing this, but basically get it out of your head and then put it away. And then the next time you sit down as a writing session, get it back out and edit it. Yep. Because you're not criticizing yourself, you're not fighting with the words to come out. And, and I think that is actually, you know, it, it's a little bit more general about the topic of copywriting, but some of the things that people find a struggle sitting down to write is because they find writing hard. Yeah, well, I think that, um, that, that, that what you're talking about there is, um, I think, well, the first time I saw it sort of spoken about was from Annie, Annie Lamont, uh, or Anne Lamont, ah, depending on Anne, um, Anne Lamont, yeah. In um, the book Bird by Bird, who's, it's a, yeah. she's a writer, and, and that book is about writing. Weird title, Bird by Bird, but I guess it's a play on word by word, I'm not too sure. But she talks about these things called downdrafts and updrafts. 
And I thought that was just an amazing way of articulating it. And, and what it's about, and, and I know Neil Strauss, who's um, a, a friend of, of mine who is a huge writer, um, you know, New York Times bestselling writer, he talks about it as well. Is that He says he, the first draft is for you, second draft for the editor, third draft for the reader. Um, and, you know, a, any scenario is that, you know, the downdraft is just to get the thing down. Just get it down mm-hmm. on paper. And then the updraft is about cleaning it up. So you're getting it down and you're cleaning it up. Um, you know, and obviously Neil's about, you know, the first draft for you, which is the writer, second draft for the editor, who's going to obviously clean it up, and the third draft is the final draft for the reader. Uh, and obviously you might have very, various iterations in between there, but that's basically what it comes down to. So with copywriting, you know, it is about getting it down um, and then cleaning it up afterwards. Absolutely, and 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 I, I I have to say I took that up because I'm one of those people that critiques my own writing really badly. I'm really harsh, um, and I was struggling, and that and and the downdraft updraft thing, the get it out of your head and then edit it, you know, however you want to look at it, that really helped me. You know, that made my process of writing and getting information out of my head so much easier. But I have one other tip, which is a productivity tip. Uh, and again, maybe this might help Kelly and her husband um, or Michelle. Um, and, and that is that initial downdraft, getting it out of your head. You can do that anywhere, anytime. If, you, if you're not focused on sitting at a keyboard or writing with a pen or whatever, if you get out your smartphone and wherever you are, you actually record audio you can then get that audio transcribed. That becomes your initial draft. Mm. Um, you know, and it's like, for example, Pete, you, you whenever, you know, whenever the, the mood strikes you, for example, you create content in the car. You record videos in the car. You could just as easily turn on your, your phone and record a message to yourself, you know, ideas and thoughts about something and get that transcribed um, while you're driving. You know, if so anybody does any kind of a commute, you know, I mean, years ago when I was, you know, worked for the big companies and stuff, I had like an hour commute both directions. Yep. Uh, and if I'd, if I'd have been trying to do, you know, trying to move out of that world and into another one trying to create content, that hour would have been one of the most valuable times I could have possibly had. Obviously, I'd have to edit out the expletives from the other drivers on the, uh, on, on the motorway, but, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's just, I, and I know a lot of people that have found a lot of success with that idea. Yep. Cool. Very cool. Very, very but, cool. But, but yeah, so first of all, experiment with different times and see what works for you is a is, is short, short version of that one. And also try different things. But this downdraft, updraft, I think, as you say, it's a great way of describing it, is, is a, great, a great thing to do to free up the pressure on yourself as a writer. Mm. So, uh, Michelle, as, as I say at the beginning, Michelle get, is getting the values. We've got another question from Michelle. Um, and this one, again, something I think you, you might be able to give some good answers to, is how do you get interviews with leaders in your marketplace? Uh, you ask. And, you know, and I know that sounds really, really basic. Uh, we have a template email. So uh, if you're interested in a copy of that that we sort of use to get to when we do reach out to your guest here on the show, uh, just email support at preneurgroup.com. I'll let the team know that I mentioned on the uh, the podcast that you can get a copy of that and we'll shoot you a copy of the template we use. By all means, just uh, you know, at least change the, the, the spelling mistakes um, when you use it yourself. Uh, don't, what I'm saying is don't just rip it off verbatim. Be sensible. Um, I'm helping you out here, guys. Don't just swipe exactly stuff word for word. Um, but, you know, literally it's, it's about asking um, and it's about positioning. Uh, so, you know, you'll see in our template we mention other guests we've had. Now, obviously, majority of the guests we have on the show these days are either personal friends or people who have actually reached out to us um, given the size of our community here and the listener base we have people know that that we can um, you know pack a punch when it comes to helping people sell a book or whatever it might be so that's because of you guys who listen so thank you uh, so we get a lot of people reaching out to us but we do reach out to the occasional guest um, that we think would be a good person on the show if there's been a great book that we've consumed so the, the template we use has a couple of things in there it mentions you know previous guests so it's a bit of social proof um, hard to start with um, if you if you don't have 
uh, people to interview or, or guests. Obviously, you know, you, you can leverage that over time. Um, and even if you have some guests that you don't think famous, put their name in the email. It just implies you've had other people and that, you know, they might go, well, I should, should I know who these people are if they're mentioning it? It's a bit of psychology in that. Uh, you know, listeners uh, and viewerships and, and, and what sort of data you have, you know, if, you, if you're if you the, 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 the biggest consultant in Tasmania, if you have a, an audience for the state of Tasmania, uh, if you have, um, you know, 13,000 followers on Twitter, um, you know, that is an audience of 13,000 people. So you can, you know, you can get creative a little bit with your copywriting in stuff like that and sort of say you have an audience of 13,000 because technically a Twitter following by technical definition is an audience. Um, so I think it's about asking asking that. I think, you know, in the actual request for an interview, actually telling them what it's about. It's not like I just want to interview you uh for the sake of interviewing you, I want to interview you about this particular topic, answering these particular key questions, show that you've got some intelligence, show that you're going to take a different angle to every other interview that person's ever done uh, and sort of give them that in, in the request. And I think those sort of two or three quick tips um, should be enough to get you your first uh, two or three in the bag and then obviously you can leverage from there. Great tips, mate. And uh, yeah, definitely uh, support preneurgroup.com if you want to have a look at that email um it has worked absolute gangbusters for us uh in lots of different contexts just to, uh, to kind of add a few things around what you were saying there pete first of all we started from nowhere we've talked about this on a number of occasions on the podcast this podcast started with me and pete having a chat and Four it got to the point we published it that's a whole other yeah point. yeah well that's that's a, that's another <laughs> point but but it was pete and i having a chat and it grew to the point where we had we, we we invited people on the show at, from different levels to the point now where publishers reach out to us and ask us if we will feature their authors and but it wasn't an overnight thing and so that, so you know it's something you can grow and maybe it'll take you some time and it's not necessarily going to happen tomorrow but there are some things that you can do and this was something actually you know I mentioned slightly jokingly that I've been listening and catching up on my audio books and things like that. And one of the things I listened to recently was something by Dan Kennedy. And he mentions this, um, and he talks about it as, as being the person that owns the media, whatever that media might be. So if you are a podcast producer, or being, being uh, a little topical, if you happen to be publishing a digital magazine, um, you know, we were talking about that at the beginning of the show with Ed Dale's digital magazine publishing platform that publishes into Apple Newsstand and soon out to Kindle and Android. You know, if you own a magazine that's going to be published into these platforms and you're publishing this on a regular basis, that is an exposure media for somebody. Now, most people want an audience. And if, you know, if you offer them an audience, they will happily give you something. You know, and, and I think Ed actually, you know, there's, there's two different things. One is any time that you can give them an easy in, like, you know, I'll interview you, here's what I want to know, would you, like, would you be happy to have a chat? But also if they've, you know, in the magazine space, um, if they've already published something, you, you can very often ask them if you can repurpose it. Mm. Um, you know, and that gets you that name. If they don't have to do any work, the ask is even less. I, I think that's a big thing is it's, it's what's in it for them and, and why would they yes. say yes? Because like yes. someone who is big, important and busy is not going to get up an hour of their time to be generous, to be completely no. blunt about it. There has no, to be something not. in it for them. So, you know, if yeah. they're promoting a thing at the time, a book, a product, a whatever, a widget of some sort at the time, it's in their best interest to get the word out about that widget. So timing yeah. is a big thing. Um, so, you know, go to someone who's very, very busy and say, hey, I just want to grab a piece of your calendar and I just want to, you know, drain your brain of stuff for no other purpose than just to get information out of you, to share with my audience, but just to share it. The chances are, to be honest, that person saying yes is probably pretty slim. Most people are going to be too busy, uh, as we spoke about earlier, just to spend a, spend a bit of time 
talking for no direct benefit for them. And it sounds selfish, but unfortunately, that's what the world of business is. So you have to make that's sure. Core, that is core business, though, isn't it? Their yeah. core business is promoting their product. But this exactly. comes back to what you were saying about the email and about including evidence and social proof. If you can show them that there's value because you've got an audience or that your audience is targeted never underestimate by the way the value if you produce a podcast that is the ultimate widget widgeters podcast um then you've got a targeted audience that you can offer to somebody exactly yeah you might you know you might only have a thousand people listen to your podcast but there are a thousand true fans of widgeting Mm. you know so, so yeah, come, that comes back to, you know, as you said, the detail of that email and the, not to just copy it word for word, but to understand what each point of the email does, which is what we always say whenever you say, you know, Pete, you say swipe and deploy, you know, what you actually mean is read it and understand what each element is doing and, exactly. and make that element work for you. Um, but yeah, so, and, and, but, but it, comes down to, it comes down to what you opened with, Pete, which is just ask uh, because you'd be amazed what you can get. Mm-hmm. Cool. Cool. Uh, do you think we can manage one more Michelle question? Uh, I love Michelle. I've known her for years, but do we have other questions we should try and squeeze into this episode? Uh, uh, go, go on then. Um, I will. I will. Uh, I'll, I'll pass over. You, you can. You can tell Michelle that we passed her over. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to get a nasty, nasty text message or a nasty, nasty email. <laughs> Yeah, well, we are we are close to time anyway. Um, okay, I am going to ask I'm going to ask this one because because I think a lot of people are interested in this for whatever reason. Um, and I'm I'm sorry, but it, it is a Michelle question. I'm just going to squeeze this last one in, please. Oh. Go on, um, because it's very interesting. Can you give a, a suggestion or ideas? Because you are the ideas person. Uh, you always come up with some off the wall stuff and great suggestions. Some ideas for growing an audience quickly online for a new product launch. Let's say you're going to launch a product or you're going to do something. Okay. Um, any ideas Look for getting the word out? The best two ways, the absolute unquestionable best two ways is pay for advertising, buy media, right. or mm-hmm. leverage and stand on the shoulders of giants and use joint ventures. Like They are absolutely by far... The best two, and they have been for all eternity. Think about it. You know, yep. back in the, yep. you know, the nineteen twenties, the seventeen hundreds, whenever it was, you know, the best two ways to actually get any traffic for anything, foot traffic into a retail store, you know, whatever it might be, it's either you pay for advertising, you put billboards up, you do radio, you do online banners, you do pay per click, whatever it might be, you do Facebook ads these days, uh, and you pay for that, uh, or you go down the joint venture path, which is an endorsement-based marketing. That's all joint ventures are. You know, when you do these big product launches and you're doing affiliate offers and all that sort of stuff, all that is is endorsement-based marketing. And that's been around for centuries as well. You know, back prior to the web, you know, Dan Kennedy, you spoke about before, was a huge advocate and still is about getting endorsed mailing. So what you do is you go to your local chiropractor and you say hey i'm a, a, a footwear store and we sell you know good sturdy footwear that can help people with back pains and it helps fix their orthotics and all that sort of stuff can you do a mail out to your client base with a coupon saying come into our retail store and you get a 10 percent discount this is the stuff we used to do uh, in the footwear business you know what 10 years ago for me now you know, we it was a lot of endorsed promotion stuff from podiatrists and physios and all that sort of stuff you know that stuff worked then it worked online now so those two are by far the best ways because you're going to be able to get a flood of referral endorsed traffic to your business through a joint venture affiliate type promotion uh, or the alternative obviously is just to pay for advertising directly and you know there's a bunch of other you know quirky ways like guests posting other people's sites and doing seo and that sort of stuff and they do work they're just going to be slower uh, and they're not going to be as big a way as a dedicated endorsed mailing excellent and I, I totally agree. I mean, the, the the joint venture thing, and we've talked about, we have actually done this. We have actually talked about joint ventures. Um, the joint venture thing, I think, is one of those things that people just don't think about. But it's one of the most powerful things you can do. If if some if an authority figure in in an industry, somebody with an existing audience or you know client base or whatever that lo- that knows, likes, and trusts them 
pops w- pops a good word in for you, there you go. That's it. Yeah. Instant instant traffic. It's simple as that. Mm. I, I really, it comes down to you know. To be honest, like so many people, I think speak to uh, about this sort of stuff, and they, they're very hesitant about spending money on advertising. And mm-hmm. to me, there's a couple of red flags or, or things you need to think about. Is that one? If you can't figure out who your target audience is well enough to be able to work out where your advertising needs to be so it's in front of those people, do you have a good enough clarity of what your business is all about and the product it's going to serve? Because yeah. so many people are like, oh, well, if I have a joint venture partner, they will mail on it because uh, it matches their audience. But okay, well, where are those audience looking for other stuff like and, and advertise there? Because so many people can't get clarity on shit, where does this product actually fit? If someone has a problem and they're looking for the solution, and this product I have is a solution to that problem. Where are they looking for that solution? People, you know, just because someone's on an email list of, of or a, a client of someone else and a, a JV affiliate promotion will work, they, there are people who aren't on that list who are proactively looking for that solution. So where are they looking and advertise there? So if you can't figure out who that is and where they're looking, that's a big red flag from a business perspective. Secondly, if you're like, well, I can't cash flow this or I'm not willing to risk throwing you know, two hundred dollars at a sale. Like, let's say, let's say hypothetically that your product is a two hundred buck product, and you're willing to, and you're willing to give away fifty percent for affiliate commission, right? If you're not willing to get a hundred dollars out of your own pocket and spend that to try and get that sale through advertising, for whatever reason, because you don't think it's going to convert well, shame on you. You don't believe in your product enough, so it won't be a success. Flat out bottom line, and I think so many people are like, "Oh, well, I don't know." Like, they're two very fundamental questions you have to answer first um, and foremost. And that's you know, we do this. You know, I've spoken to this many times, and um, I actually did an interview. Actually, it's probably a while ago now with with Ed, Ed Dale about how we sort of grow our businesses. And you know, when we want to test something, you know, back in the challenge days, you know, when Ed was talking about the thirty day challenge, and it was all about you know trying to test a market over thirty days to get your first buyer to make sure your product was profitable. And it was all about you know doing SEO and a whole bunch of stuff to sort of get that first sale and test your market. Uh, and that's a great strategy if you want to take that slower path. And in the interview I spoke about, I said. Anytime we're going to test a market, we'll take a thousand bucks and throw AdWords traffic at it. We want to fast track that result. We want to know that it's going to be profitable. We're not going to wait 30 days and try and do it slowly and and and, and find out it might not work and, and, and try and get a joint venture partner or wait for SEO traffic to sort of bubble through. We're going to go, no, we believe in this product, we believe in this service, we believe in this market. We're going to throw a thousand bucks at it, five thousand bucks, a hundred bucks, whatever it might be, to test it. You get quicker results, you get feedback uh, loops, you know, shortened, uh, and, you know, you should believe in your product enough to throw some advertising at it because unquestionably, advertising, paid advertising is by far the quickest way to get results when it comes to traffic generation. Next thing is obviously joint ventures if you've got some people who will mail for you, and then obviously you've got SEO and blogging and guest posting and podcasting and all the other stuff that at the end of the day is noise. Like, let, let's, let's be frank about it. This podcast... We're up to 107, 108 episodes or so now, and it's huge for us. We're getting, you know, thousands of downloads of the show every single day, and it's great. But it is not the best traffic generator we have. It's, it's, you know, people are out listening, washing the dishes, walking the dog, running, cycling, consuming great content, but it's not giving us a direct traffic source. Um, you know, there's plenty of other things we've done, like paid advertising, funnily enough, joint venture promotions, uh, blogging for so, so much time, Facebook ads, all that sort of stuff is the stuff that generates real traffic for a launch of a product. Uh, and we're going to be doing some stuff. We've got some new launches coming up over the next couple of months of our own stuff, and it's going to be interesting to sort of see and show you guys what we're actually doing to grow these things. Absolutely, we're gonna as and as always, we're gonna do what we say, and we're gonna tell you what we do. So, uh, but yeah, it, it's again, it, it's that simple, you know. There there are some proven things in the history of, you know, history of marketing and advertising and all the rest of that uh, that have been true forever, uh, and that's definitely two of them. But but so, again, cool. the thing is, this is the thing as well. Is like you know, to come out of nowhere with a product launch, uh, and you know, it's, it's, you know, remember like everyone's sort of probably a lot of people here first heard about about me through the uh, Profit Hacks launch uh, last year with Rich Chevron, um, or Chevron, depending, you know, if you want to pronounce it correctly or not. <laughs> um, and, you know, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, Pete Williams came out of nowhere and it was, you know, it was amazing, blah, blah, blah. 
you know, let's put this into perspective. I started my first business when I was 17, 14 years ago. I wrote my first book when I was 22, 23, which was, what, you know, nine years ago. Um, you know, I was you know, doing stuff um, in the internet marketing space for a number of years, you know, hung out with Ed and his team while I was growing my real world business because the internet marketing stuff intrigued me. And, you know, that, that was six or seven years in the making. You know, it was after speaking at, you know, numerous conferences around the world, um, unpaid that rich sort of you know quote unquote found me and it sounds wanky as hell because you know i was being in the media here in australia with a whole bunch of success before that but a lot of people sort of see that as like you know i was instant like how do you get rich to give you a promotion well you work your fucking ass off for nine years in a particular space and then you'll have that success read listen to uh you know the audible free version of um total recall arnold schwarzenegger's book he hustled his butt off before he became, you know, um, the bodybuilding champion that he was. He hustled his butt off in late night acting classes. He started a real estate business, a mail order business, a whole bunch of businesses to build up his wealth, you know, and then he became a politician. Like it wasn't just he decided to become a politician. He worked really, really hard, educated himself and hustled. And that, that's the thing, you know, it is, there, there is, there are some, if you're willing to pay for it, there are some shortcuts like advertising. If you're not willing to pay for that, then you've got to work your butt off and get those um, relationships and, and, and build the traffic organically and stuff like that. While you just climb down off that soapbox, I'll just dig out the next question. <laughs> Please do. You're absolutely right. You are absolutely right. Uh, and it's, it is important. I think it's important that people realize this stuff, mm. you know, and I, I know that's not what Michelle's. I know Michelle. I know Michelle's hugely successful in Tasmania, doing a great job. I know that wasn't her question, but for the listeners, like we do get these questions occasionally. It's like, you know, oh, how do I make five grand next? How do I make start a five grand business next month? How do I start a twenty grand business next month? And you know, I, I don't know how to answer that because I don't know how to start a business that's going to make you twenty grand next month. You know, I know how to work your butt off so then you have a business in a few years' time. That realistically, if you if I said to you that, you know, here's a three-year plan that in three years' time, you're going to have a business that's going to give you 20 grand a month working two days a week, would you be realistically happy with that? On the outs- on the surface, people would say yes, but no one's willing to go through those three years. But that's what it takes. Ask anybody, you know. Even sort of, you know, the, the, the outliers to a certain extent, like Mark Zuckerberg who started Facebook. You know, he started businesses beforehand. You, you, you read the books about him. He worked. Uh, and hardly slept and coded after hours on various projects before Facebook. You know, it wasn't just he had this one idea one, one morning or, you know, potentially stole the idea if you want to believe that crap, that, and then had this website that became instant success. Yeah, the, the site became an instant success, but he wasn't. And this is, you know, the interesting thing, the outliers, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, we spoke about him earlier. He did, what, 150 episodes of The Thunder Show, you know, aka the Wine Library TV, before he became Gary Vaynerchuk, the brand. He, you know, did those videos to audiences of three every single day, every single week. He would just do them and, and, and did the reps for that, you know. And now he can pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, I've got a new book coming out. Um, Tim, can you, you know, post it on the fourhourblog.com and get me, you know, 50,000 buys. You know, he can do that now because he did the reps and that's the thing. I think I think that entire that whole point is is wrapped up really well actually in the book Outliers. Mm. Um, You know, it 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 just very very briefly, folks. If you haven't read Outliers, it didn't make it onto our reading list uh, that we talked about recently. Um, But it's a fascinating book about people that you know a lot of a lot of people that you that you will probably know, and some people that you might not know. But they're all leaders in their field or considered to be leaders in their field from sports to business to whatever. And they're people that a lot of people conceive, perce- sorry, perceive as being instant successes, you know, that they were always successful people. And it's the story of the reality, the truth, the history, the hard yards, doing the reps, all the rest of it. That's it. I mean, you know, summary of the book, do the reps. <laughs> And don't believe the sales letter. <laughs> yeah, that too. Cool. All right. Um, we are we're we're pushing for a long episode today, Pete. So let's uh, let's try and wrap up the last. I've got two questions left for you. Ooh, and, wow. Well, I say I've got two questions left for you. I don't think you will even understand the next question. Okay. What do you do when you realise that you're in a rut? And you can't seem to get down to knuckle down and do the work. 
I understand that question. Do you? I understand it. Never happened to you, has it? <laughs> oh, no, let's, let's, come on, let's be serious about it. Of course it has. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I, I love it that, you know, you know I'm, I love being perceived as on this pedestal of greatness, but let's be freaking honest about it. That's not true. There's definitely times where you, you, you struggle and stuff like that. But I think, you know, uh, I would love to hear your answer on this, though, I think. Um, well, I, my perspective on this is slightly different to yours. So, no, go ahead with, with, the, with the Pete Williams official answer, and then I will uh, – maybe, this, maybe this is my soapbox. Well, I, I don't really have an official answer. I, I think it is about small wins, uh, momentum, you know, and, and it's going to sound really weird, but, you know, the, the one suggestion I would have, and uh, I, I've seen this work numerous times, is get an accountability partner. And, you know, make promises to each other that I'm going to do this today. And don't try and take over the world. Just have that accountability. You know, for me, that's worked really, really well. For others, it might not be their psychology, uh, their little bent that, that, that works for them. But for me, you know, I've found that, you know, having someone that every day I'm going to email, uh, you know, what it is I'm going to try and do that day, uh, what I didn't do today that I tried to, those sort of just accountability questions, which we've spoken about, I'm sure, uh, on the show before, you know, just having, having being accountable to someone else, um, for me, has worked really, really well because then I'm not throwing my little pity party anymore. That I, I, I it's my reputation, it's my ego to a certain extent on the line with a friend or or a foe. Um, you know, looking at something like Stick dot com could be a way to, to sort of put a financial um, thing around that. Um, and sort of just changing the perspective and the frame and the context, I think, around that can be helpful. Um, but I know, you know, there's other circumstances where the rut can be defined and created a different way. And this is where I think, you know, you could be could be good to chat about. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, you, you know, you, you pulled me on it and, and I was joking. I know that it all is not rosy and light in the world of Pete on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you do, you know, you, you can struggle to get things done. We all struggle to get things done. And everybody has... You get frustrated with me for not, not uh, doing something that we said we were going to do. Let's be frank about it. I'm not perfect. Yeah, you know, but but this is you know the the thing you said there is get an accountability partner. Um, hello, everybody. One hundred and eight episodes later, I am Dom Goucher. I am Pete's accountability partner for the podcast. Yep, folks, work it out. You know, it's like you're literally listening to us living what we say. You know, this podcast could possibly not have happened. On a number of occasions, either through my, you know, my not getting going or Pete's not getting going or Pete's life overtaking him or whatever, you know, Um, just like any project anywhere, you know, we all have these things like, you know, Kelly's question. She's got a a new family, Uh, her her and her husband are both self-employed. Being self-employed is hard, folks. It's hard being the person that. When you start the day, you have to decide what it is you're going to do. Then you have to do it. Then you have to check that you did it. And you have to do that every day. That is hard. Anybody that's not tried it, try it. Because it's hard. You know, don't, and so, no, number one, number one, because this is, sorry, this is Steve's question. Steve, if you are a solopreneur, if you're, you know, self-employed, do not feel bad if you find this hard. Mm. Okay, Absolutely. please do not feel hot. You know, anybody, if you go, if you have a job, you know, if you work for a company or you have a boss or whatever, the flip side of that coin, by the way, is, is be grateful that, that that's their problem. You might not think that they're great people and that it's a great job and all the rest of it, but that's part of what that work, that, um, you know, the generic term was, was this idea of the factory, you know, a factory is anything that turns that, that, that organizes people and gets gets something done. Could it could be an office, it could be a genuine manufacturing plant, it doesn't matter. But you know, that was the idea. Was you know, a couple of people have the idea about what everybody needs to do, and then everybody else just does what they're told. And the moment that you step into it on your own, all that work's yours on top of getting it done. Mm. So don't feel bad about that. That's that's the important point, you know. Um, but basically, Pete, everything that you said. You know, um, is is what I what my response was going to be to this question. You know, um, 
the first thing is, and it's actually a great, fantastic thing, and this applies to everybody, whether you find it hard to do something, you find it hard to get started, you find it hard to keep going or whatever. This thing I heard the other day uh, called the 1% solution. Okay. All right? Now, I think a lot of people, if you if you read any generic advice, all the armchair advice from people about, you know, managing a big project, everybody says break it up into smaller pieces, okay? And it is good advice. You know, if you're looking at a big thing that you want to do, create something, get something started, get something moving, whatever it is, pick a small piece. Break it up into smaller pieces until there's something you can do, okay? That's one thing I would say. But this, the 1% solution is very simple. Do something anything at all towards that goal each and every day. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And if that thing is 1% towards your goal, it's actually not going to take that long and you'll reach the goal. Yep. You know? And 1% of of anything is not big. Yeah? Agreed. Okay? You know, that's an extreme version of this idea of chunking something up into smaller pieces. You know? But the, the the thing that really is it, and I think, again, this is the thing that, that people start in their own business, solopreneurs and stuff, you know, it, it's, it's the self-accountability is a massive problem. So having an accountability partner, whether it's your, you know, if, if it's your life partner, it's somebody you live with, you know, they don't even have to understand what it is you do. They just, you know, being blunt about it, maybe they need to understand that if you don't do it, you won't pay the bills. <laughs> you know, maybe it's like that. Yep. You know, I've been, I've been there. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna put my hand up. I've been there. I have been there. That it's a do it or don't pay the bills day. And even in those circumstances, I know that people, for whatever reasons you know, just can't move. And having somebody, you know, whether whether it's it's your spouse, your partner, or whether it's just a friend, work colleague, you know, team member, whoever it is, and you say to them, look, I'm going to do this. This is this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it in this, you know, this is what I need to get done. This is what I need to get it done by. Um, and just have somebody that you have to speak up to. Yep. You know, I mean, the, the, the ultimate accountability was me and my big mouth and the... Um, the the magazine in seven days mm. you know i opened my big mouth and i said that's it i'm gonna do it and everybody was watching and i had to do it i i had to at least keep going and i had to make a good go of it yeah if i hadn't have said that out loud then i could have just sloped off i could have just gone do you know what pete i've done this for two days i'm not sure it's going the way i wanted it to go i think i just won't do it mm. um but but you know i put it out there made myself accountable to, to the printer community. Um, and it helped motivate me when, when it got hard and it got hard. Uh, <laughs> and, but the other thing, you know, and I talked to get, again, I talked about this earlier is, is, is positive constraints. And you talk about positive constraints a lot, you know, um, whether it's, you know, Oh, you really need to record an audio for something, Right. Well, one of the tricks that we've talked about in the past about making sure that you get get an audio recorded for something is to actually invite somebody onto a planned webinar or teleconference as an audience and you do the audio as a presentation to them. You book it, you invite people, and once they're booked on, then you're going to have to turn on. It's a kind of a form of accountability. You know, but those are the things. But I think the bigger, the bigger issue is, 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 to me, that people don't talk about is that they they feel bad because it feels hard, mm. you know? And that's I just I just wanted to say that because I think I, I've come across a few people that feel that way, and you shouldn't. It's hard. That's what it is. Yeah, kind of speaking back to what you were talking about about doing the hard yards. Yeah. Cool. So, so best of luck, Steve. If you are finding it hard, hopefully that was uh, give you some ideas and uh, just keep keep plodding along. Go with that one percent solution. Love it. Love so the last question of our Q&A collection um, is something from Dave in Australia. Uh, hi, Dave. And uh, Dave um, has got, you know, been taking our recommendations for Audible uh, from the podcast from through various things. Now, Dave is somebody that came to the podcast. He admits he mentioned this in his message. Uh, came to the podcast late and has been uh, catching up. 
you know, and so going through a recommended uh, reading and whatever. Um, but they've asked us if we have any books that we can recommend for people who are just starting out. Well, clearly now, we're going to say uh, the Lean Startup, of course, because uh... well, yeah, well, you can you can pick on me if you want, but you already did that in an entire episode that we did not so long ago, which was our summer reading list. Mm. And that summer reading list was exactly this, wasn't it? It was, yeah. you know, whatever business you're in, whatever position you're in, these are the books we absolutely recommend. And definitely, if you're thinking of starting out, there's a lot of kind of mindset books, ways of thinking, perspective books, general business and marketing things um, in that list, uh, in that show. So they've and anybody else who, who wants our recommendations of the kind of must-read books, um, I'm going to put a link in the show notes, as we always do, um, to the show, which was a couple of episodes ago, which was our summer reading list, and which covered those books. And yes, the first book I talked about was The Lean Startup, Peter. I love it. <laughs> I love it too. As much as I love you Mucos. I love it. Um, sorry. <laughs> It's a very, it's a, lots of very valuable lessons in that book. I, I completely agree. It is a fantastic read or a fantastic listen. Indeed, indeed. Okay, folks. So that ends our wrap up of the Q and A questions. That started with our live one hundredth show. I just want to say thank you to everybody that came on the show. Uh, and ask the questions live and that, uh, that we, we, we managed to answer them live uh, and everybody that's recorded their audio version of their questions um, and just, you know, people that have uh, that joined in that live show. It was a great experience and uh, maybe we'll do one again soon, P. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Because we got great feedback about that and uh, it's just, it's unfortunate, it's difficult to, you know, we, we love to answer questions fully so it's difficult to get a lot of answers into the, the show length that we like to keep it to. Um, but uh, yeah, so thank you to everybody. And um, thank you to everybody as well that's been commenting on the shows. Um, you know, we, we do occasionally, if somebody leaves us an audio comment and, and gives us permission, we put that comment in the show. Uh, but we've been getting some fantastic feedback about the whole range of shows because people join us at different points and go back and listen and work their way through. Um, and they've been leaving, uh, leaving comments on iTunes and over on, uh, on preneurmedia.tv uh, recently. And uh, just, I just want to say thank you to everybody that's been leaving us uh, comments. You can, as always, leave us a comment on iTunes. Just go to the uh, iTunes page for Preneurcast and leave a comment in your particular country. Um, mm -hmm. Pete, do you want to mention uh, about preneurmedia.tv? Yeah, we're actually uh, killing it. No, well, well, we are technically. <laughs> what, we're, what we're doing is uh, we decided to make it easy for everyone in the community and just basically pull everything back into one website. So Noise Reduction, who a lot of you probably subscribe to, which is our weekly uh, newsletter of the, the, the best things on the web to reduce all that noise that's out there online, that, that newsletter that had a website over at Noise dot re uh, is moving uh, into preneurmarketing.com uh, preneurmedia.tv the home of um, the preneurcast podcast is, is is going to move as part of preneurmarketing.com uh, and as part of all this preneurmarketing.com is getting a complete facelift as well so depending on when you listen to the show it may have already happened we're making it a lot more sort of content centric um, sort of taking away a lot of the sidebars and stuff like that, kind of going a bit, you know, what is it, Web 4.0 now, whatever the heck that number's up to. So basically, yeah, preneurmarketing.com uh, will be the new home of everything uh, revolving uh, and incorporating and um, related to the preneur community. So the blog will be there, us will be there as well, the noise reduction updates and a whole bunch of other really cool stuff. We've got some, some awesome tools and new reports and downloads and calculators and some other really cool stuff uh, planned out for the next sort of couple of months as we roll that out and, and really uh, pad it out as well. So, um, yeah, it's very, very exciting. If anyone's got any sort of books they've written that want to sort of, uh, you know, publish an excerpt of that, uh, we're sort of open to that sort of stuff. The odd guest post, but more so, it's going to be more about you know, got a book you want to promote, um, you know, let us publish a chapter on the shot on the site and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, reach out if you've got some ideas and stuff like that. Support at preneurgroup.com. So the email address will be always support at preneurgroup.com because that's obviously the group of all the businesses that we have here, uh, not just preneur marketing and the preneur cast. But uh, yeah, check that out at some point at your leisure. 
uh, comment, interact. It's all good stuff happening over there at printermarketing.com. Exactly. Have I said that domain name enough now? <laughs> I think you might have said it, but just in case you haven't said it enough, I will put it in the show notes along with everything else. So, folks, normally… And those show notes will be on printermarketing.com. You beat me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so on that excellent wrap up, uh, folks, we will see you all next week. With an awesome interview uh, that is definitely worth checking out. Um, and I'm going to give a bit of a teaser on this one. It's the first interview where I got choked up and lost for words at the start of. Um, so uh, it's pretty powerful. So uh, come and uh, listen next week. <laughs> You've been enjoying another fine episode of PrinterCast with Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at www.printermarketing.com or drop them a line via printercast at printergroup.com.